بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان سيدنا ومولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا الى يوم الدين اما بعد my dear respected ulama my dear respected brothers um, sisters if there are sisters here not sure listeners my talk today is not to be considered a full speech in any manner that i'm going to leave for the more learned scholars that will be gracing our midst inshallah my prayer is that they'll be able to do justice to this vast subject and this personality i'm here to just provide some reflections on this great man a mountain of knowledge and gnosis ma'rifa physician and sage of the ummah reformer of the masses jami'u sharia wa tariqa one who held together both the sacred law and the spiritual path the ghazali of his time maulana ashraf ali thanwi and these things are not said just rhetorically there is a tradition when we're describing or defining someone when we're introducing someone we put all of these titles on but really every single one of these titles is very apt for this person and none of this is being said with any kind of Uh, uh, with any kind of bias in any way it's purely it's not done any out of emotion it is the truth inshallah i'll explain later while i confirm on him the title ghazali of his time but first i'm here just to speak about three particular distinguishing characteristics of maulana ashrafi thanwi I'll be here just to speak about three characteristics. I am I am uh very honored to speak about this and I would request that you listen to this carefully. Number 1, one, one thing about Maulana Tanwi what made him so great if you were to span his life. The first thing that comes to mind is his acute and refined understanding of the human self, the psychological recognition. because the practice of self reformation in tasawwuf or sufism pertains to both the external conditions and the interior conditions of the human being sufi masters traditionally have always paid attention to the role of human psychology in the moral and religious disciplining of the individual within the history of sufism in south asia which in which india also uh, comes sustained attention to the human psyche is evident in the fawaid al fuad of nizamuddin awliya rahimahullah the maktubat of sheikh ahmed al sabhindi rahimahullah the al khair al kathir and the at tafhimat al ilahiya of shah waliullah dehlawi and also in the tarbiyat al salik the malfuzat or the aphorisms and the khutbat the lectures of hakim al ummat maulana ashraf ali thanwi you'll see this distinguished this distinguishing character within these books just like you saw it in the earlier sufis Tarbiyatu Salik to take Tarbiyatu Salik in particular it's a three volume collection of correspondences between Maulana Tanwi and his murids or spiritual students in these letters students narrated to him accounts of their spiritual maladies and personal struggles but also mystical experiences and spiritual achievements in his replies he advised them on methods to cope with their stress anxiety and melancholia that This was the case only when he perceived these experiences to be overstated. In genuine cases of progression he advised on how to maintain or advance further from that state. In other words, he was a true spiritual master who could diagnose the barriers of the spiritual path very well. These letters stand witness to the unconditional trust his students placed in him, disposing of themselves to him as medical patients hand over their bodies to physicians just like you feel so so confident to put yourself in the hands of a doctor these people felt confident in giving them their their souls their hearts to nurture to hakim al ummat maulana ashraf ali thanwi if his clear and succinct replies disciplined his disciples 
They were also resplendent with affection and care. In this way, he came across to his students as their fellow traveler and not their managerial overseer. He often used the terms ikhtiyari or voluntary and ghair ikhtiyari or involuntary in his replies to their letters. If evil thoughts or wayward desires and undesirable dispositions were ghair ikhtiyari, then the disciple should put his mind at ease and not worry about any reprehension, for one is not accountable for involuntary khatarat, involuntary thoughts that come in the mind. However, if one chases after such blameworthy thoughts, then there is culpability since the person uses his own will and volition to advance an accidental thought into a conscious object of pursuit. In this way, he comforted many of his disciples who would lose courage when they were met with egoistic whisperings. His mastery of the craft of guiding his disciples earned him the title Hakim al-Ummah, the spiritual physician of the masses. Because of his recognition of psychological complexity and variation, he guided his students according to their spiritual needs and temperamental differences. For example, when it came to Mufti Muhammad Hassan of Amritsar, which is in Punjab, Maulana Tanwi asked him to repeat the final year of Darsi Nidami, of the Darsi Nidami curriculum, the Dawratul Hadith, the year in which the six canonized collections of Hadith are read. Now, just to diverge there a bit, if you look at the great ulama of the time who have left an indelible mark today that you can recognize, if I put some of these names in front of you, you'll be able to recognize them. You'll find that some of the greatest of those names were attached to Maulana Tanwi. For example, Maulana Shabbir Ahmed Uthmani, the commentator of the Quran as we know him. Uh, we're talking about uh, Sheikh Abdul Majid Dariyabadi, another commentator of the Quran who went through some ideological problems and then, alhamdulillah, he met Maulana Tanwi. Maulana Fateh Muhammad Jalandri, another translator of the Quran. Again, these are all people who've left mark behind, who've left a mark behind. Then you've got Maulana Idris Khandelwi, another mufassir of the Quran, a historian. I mean, these were people who, were, who had mastery of many different sciences. Then you have Maulana Yusuf bin Nuri, rahmatullahi alayhi. Again, another famous person, uh, the, the, the founder of the, the great Bin Nuri town, Madrasa, and subhanAllah, you can imagine uh, the tradition that he's left behind. Maulana Masiullah Khan sahab. That's another one. It's one of the recent ones, in fact. And one of the most recent is Maulana Abrar al Haqsab of Hardoi, rahmatullahi alayhi, alayhim ajma'in. Uh, he was one of the last of the khulafa of Maulana Shabali Tanwi. Each one is, in itself, just a very specifically nurtured pearl on their own. Subhanallah. So that was the case with Mufti Muhammad Hassan of Amritsar. He made him do the Dawratul Hadith again. Yet, on the other hand, Maulana Tanwi had recognized Mufti Muhammad Hassan's devotion and willingness to perfect himself and therefore he did not hesitate to advise a mufti to repeat the same year the last year of the alimiya program again however when dealing with the great muslim historian sayyid suleiman nadwi sayyid suleiman nadwi whose uh, whose seerah is very famous who, which he uh, co-wrote with shibli nu'mani who was actually his teacher as well maulana tanwi with him demonstrated a different act great forbearance patience and humility Sayyid Sulaiman Nadu had a very, very close mentoring relationship with the poet Muhammad Iqbal and had also been trained by Allama Shibli Nu'mani, someone with whom Mawlana Tanwi had expressed his disagreement. Mawlana Tanwi understood that for Sayyid Sulaiman Nadwi to turn to Tasawwuf and to Mawlana Tanwi, his expression of interest in becoming a disciple of Mawlana Tanwi were acts of great courage and humility. Thus, Maulana Tanwi reciprocated this humility and coupled it with tactful advices that created a bond with Sayyid Sulaiman Nadwi such that it led Sayyid Sulaiman Nadwi to declare Maulana Tanwi as the Jami'ul Mujaddideen. Jami'ul Mujaddideen, coming from a historian with that background, subhanAllah, rahimahumullah, the composite of the revivers. Mujaddid is the reviver. Mawlana Tanwi also understood the importance of audience awareness. Now, what we've been speaking about so far is his understanding of uh, individuals, especially individuals of uh, some status. That was not all. His lectures were well attended. He, used to, he could go on for five, seven hours, two hours was average, as I heard yesterday. Mawlana Tanwi also understood the importance of audience awareness. Even a cursory look at his writings, which number in the hundreds, about 900 or so, revealed that he was a gifted writer in Urdu 
Arabic and Persian. If you just, for the ulama, if you just get a copy of the Bawadir and Nawadir, it's a struggle to read through that book. Such varied topics that, are, that you could say are uh, summaries of really complex ideas that he summarizes in few lines using uh, all the sciences that he has, uh, he has access to. And you'd have to draw from many different sciences and disciplines to be able to even understand it. So, when he spoke to a general audience though, he employed simple phrases, everyday examples and popular idioms to convey his message. Something which I may not be doing today, unfortunately. Maulana Tanwi would take his audience members to higher levels of abstraction as the lecture progressed, only after they had understood his conceptual framework. Very good. I mean, if you read any of his khutbat, you, you'll see how he uh, keeps it focused, but his knowledge just pours out. Number two, that was the first point, his understanding of the human self. Number two is his pension for discipline, organization, meticulousness. How does a man who lives a standard age, uh, lives to a standard age, an average age, do so much work and so much accomplishment and deal with so many people? One is that you lock yourself away in a room and just write. That's not what he did. He was there available. He spoke to people. He corresponded with people. How does somebody do that? Clearly there's a concept of barakah. But then we need to show something from our own self. And here it's his penchant for tanzim and tartib, organization, meticulousness, discipline. For Mona Natanwi, much anxiety could be avoided if people were meticulous in living, in living organized lives. He really pushed for that. In his practice of everyday life, Mona Natanwi saw interpersonal engagements, material objects, and devotional and devotional practices as means to cultivate self-restraint. He embodied unmatched self-discipline when it came to arranging his own material possessions and organizing his living space as part of the larger object objective of perfecting the social sphere of life. In this regard, he taught that everything that needs to be done, regardless of how mundane an activity and simple an activity it may be, must be done with due care and deliberation to ensure that it is done in the best manner possible. Ihsan, best manner possible that can bring maximum convenience to oneself and everyone also affected by it. Well, he's thoughtful about the other person as well. Most importantly, he taught this punctiliousness, which essentially means strict atten attention to detail, very strict attention to detail, to be an integral part of the deen. He considered to be, this to be an integral part of the deen and practiced it for which divine reward can be sought, he said. You can be rewarded for it. People visiting his Khanaqa not only listen to the words of a pious and learned saint, but also witness how the symbiosis of ilm and amal, how the amalgamation, the coming together of ilm and amal, can transform an individual's body and his immediate surroundings. Everything was so organized and you had to adhere to that organization. Otherwise, you'd be booted out. Maulana Tanwi kept a strict schedule to manage his time, a quality of, upon which the following anecdote sheds light. Uh, sheds light. Imagine this. Shaykh al-Hind Maulana Mahmud al-Hassan was his teacher. He was his ustad. <coughs> At the Darlum Deoban when he had studied there. Shaykh al-Hind once visited Maulana Tanwi in Tanabawan. The latter was elated. Maulana Shabali Tanwi was very happy, very elated at this opportunity to enjoy the company of his teacher. However, when it came time to conduct his daily research and writing at a time slotted for writing only, just like as the Sheikh Zakaria did as well, Rahmatullahi Ali, he respectfully asked Sheikh Al Hind if he could be excused to spend some time in his scriptorium, in his, in his study, in his writing place. Impressed, now the Ustaz didn't say, you know, impressed with his meticulous devotion to ilm, Shaykh al-Hind answered that you must attend to your daily routine. You must go and attend to your daily routine. These qualities of Maulana Tami proved useful for many purposes. Many things came out of this. Number one, prolific production and sheer industry in writing. 900 or so books and not just little risalas. Not just these simple khutbat, no. Serious work, serious. Training of his disciples, that was also an engaging in his own devotional rituals. He was benefiting the people that came to him personally. 
He was benefiting the Ummah at large and continues to. And he was also not forgetting himself. Which is a challenge for people who are very active. They're so busy with others, they forget themselves. These are the three things that he was able to achieve. Number two, he was also able to attend to many different tasks because he had dis disciplined himself to make time for each of them. He had time for every. He had two wives as well. He had time for everything. And number three, the third thing you get out of this is peace of mind and personal convenience. I Imam Ghazali's words come to mind here. I mentioned he's the Ghazali of his time. Imam Ghazali, rahmatullahi alayhi, his words come to mind here. Imam Ghazali says in Bidayat al-Hidayah, your time should not be without any structure such that you occupy yourself arbitrarily, arbitrarily with whatever comes along. You're just waiting for your friends to call you. You're just sitting on your, what do you call it, Facebook and Twitter. That's all you're doing, right? No. Rather, you must take account of yourself and order your worship during the day and the night, assigning to each period of time an activity that must not be neglected nor replaced by another activity. By this ordering of time, the barakah and blessing of time will show itself. You want barakah in time? This is the way to do it. A person who leaves himself without a plan, as animals do, not knowing what he is to do at any given moment, will spend most of his time fruitlessly. Your time is your life, and your life is your capital. By it you make your trade. And by it you will reach the eternal bounties in the proximity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every single breath of yours is a priceless jewel because it is irreplaceable. Once it is gone, there is no return for it. So do not be like fools who rejo rejoice each day as their wealth increases while their lives decrease. What good is there in wealth that increases while one's lifespan decreases? Mawlana Tanwi's sense of discipline also comes across in his writing. Very academic style. Never been to a university. But even from a modern perspective, you can appreciate his work. His writing is timeless, essentially. He first defines his terms. When I use this word, istilah, I mean this by it. Because a word could be used in many different meanings. So he defines what I mean by this word. Cuts out arguments. Then sets out a general argument and then presents evidence to persuade his readers. Mawlana Thanwi despised conversational meanderings, which means just talking aimlessly, just going on about something, and muddled concepts. In his lectures, he often spoke on a few Quranic verses, if not only just a single verse, and preferred not to overtax the minds of his listeners by jumping from one idea to another. He preferred clarity of expression, logical argumentation that his audience could relate to and fully appreciate and a balanced appeal to human emotions. During the first 10 days of the month of Muharram, an example, when the Shia are doing their ta'ziyah, he would organize lectures on the virtuous lives of Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, Hassan, Hussein, radiallahu anhum ajma'in. He spoke about these pious predecessors in such an effective way that even some of the Shia would abandon their ta'ziyah and come and listen to his lectures. A very productive way, instead of condemning, he is using a productive way to bring them in. Mona Tami's lectures and writings deal with real problems and concrete, uh, real people and concrete problems. He's not writing hypothetically. He's writing about what his experience has been with people. And he eschewed disembodied guidelines. His texts stemmed out of social and personal, often practical contexts. He was not just a mere preacher. Rather, like Imam Ghazali, Mawlana Tanri spoke in ways that addressed his audience members' epistemological understanding of the world so that they could see apparently and clearly Allah's greatness and the Prophet's significance in their most mundane activities. Uh, Mufti Taqi Uthmani, in his talk yesterday, he brought about a number of these things of what Tanwi and Tasawwuf and Sufism is all about. And inshallah, I leave that to uh, Mufti Taqi Uthmani. This is quite different from other preachers who sometimes speak for hours on the virtues of this or that or who only narrate long stories from the Quran for strengthening the faith of their listeners. Mawlana Tanwi delivered his lectures with a highly systematic approach in which he explained to his audience why he is speaking to them in the first place, what he wants to convey to them and how this is relevant for their everyday lives. When they are already tuned, then if that's the case, then they are already tuned to the divine. However, if they profess the greatness of Allah, but cannot see the applicability of Allah's commandment in their everyday lives, 
then they are negligent of the divine. In this manner, everything Mawlana Thanwi said was an invitation into a lived world. In essence, he transformed the perception of the deen in the public mind from that of sour grapes to one that permeates their most mundane of activities, that in everything you do, from your eating to whatever you do, you can be rewarded for it, and it's deen. Thus bringing about the realization that deen is intrinsically relevant to every individual for every act that you do. And the third point, before I conclude, the third distinctive quality and characteristic is his emphasis on the, the unison of discursive knowledge and embodied knowledge. Knowledge that's spoken and knowledge that is actually practiced. We speak a lot, but do we practice it? In many ways, Mawlana Thanwi advanced our understanding of the traditional definition of knowledge, according to which knowledge is the acquisition of the form image of a thing in the intellect. For the ulama, al-ilmu huwa husulu surati shay'i fi dhihni as Imam, as, uh, Imam Jurjani has uh, defined. For Mawlana Thanwi though, such a definition of ilm is obvious. Mawlana Thanwi wrote, if ilm was mere informational expertise, then it could become possible with disobedience as well. Even with unbelief, he pushed for notions of knowledge that transcend discursive words human beings can just retrieve from their memory or articulate by means of concepts. If ilm was mere information, Mawlana Thanwi argued, then there are Christians in Beirut and Germany, uh, maybe a lot of the Orientalists as well, who write in the Arabic language, and are also imbued with strong memory and sharp minds. Ilm, however, encompasses much more than symbols and sounds and ideas contained cognitively through repetition and conceptualization. Mawlana Thanwi said, the reality of ilm is the reality of light and nur, regarding which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, indeed light and a clear book has come to you from Allah. While words or signifiers and concepts, the signified, make up the form and just function of ilm, its essence is metaphysical and ontological. Which means there's a reality to it that needs to be lived for a person to be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After stating things in their abstract and categorical formulations, Mawlana Tanwi often provided illustrative examples. He cites an incident memorialized about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Many of us must have heard it. During one of the Prophet sallallahu journeys, he decided to take rest under the shade of a tree. As he was resting, an adversary took hold of his sword, woke him up and threatened him by asking him, Who can save you from me? The Prophet ﷺ remained calm in this condition and replied, Allah will save me. Allah. The adversary trembled and submitted to the Prophet ﷺ at seeing the latter's courage and lack of apprehension. Mawlana Tanwi uses this example to explain how the ideal embodiment of ilm reaches beyond words and concepts. This is ilm otherwise, this is ilm, otherwise even the devil knows words very well. That's what he said. If in Mawlana Tanwi's hands, ilm and amal both became existential life projects, styles of embodied existence and material come metaphysical realities, a wider survey of his malfudat his aphorisms can illustrate Mawlana Tanwi's unique understanding of the unison of ilm and amal. Here it suffices to say that in its essence, ilm necessitates amal. This is why his malfudat and mawa'id are resplendent. I would suggest we all get copies of them and read them. Unfortunately, the bulk of them have not been translated into English, if even a few of them. That's something I'll speak about later. This is why his malfudat and mawa'id are resplendent with an incredible amount of transformative power. His teachings have continuously transformed spoken subject, spoken subjects into practicing persons, as was the case with, uh, with his khulafa, including Sayyid Sulaiman Nadwi. In a public lecture delivered in Delhi on 15 April 1922, 17th of Sha'ban, 1340 Hijri, which was later published as Ta'zim al-Ilm, The Greatness of Knowledge, Mawlana Tanwi shared with his audience nuggets of advice that presuppose, presupposed such a transformative understanding of knowledge. One of these pieces of advice pertaining to the desire for fame and fortune. People use their knowledge or their other expertise for fame. <coughs> Epistemophilia, which means love of knowledge, excessive love of knowledge, just driven by desire for fame, 
argued Monnathanwi, devalues the intrinsic goodness of knowledge. While fame and fortune can be material assets when it comes to other things, such as ownership of land, in the case of knowledge, fame and fortune are functions of one's imagination. Maulana Tanwi, for Maulana Tanwi, even the recognition that others bestow upon one because of knowledge, driven by the desire for fame, it's going to be temporary and illusory. He argued that because the desire for fame becomes the chief driving force of such knowledge acquisition, one psychic complex had precluded the attainment of moral perfection. Because of the desire for fame stood between discursive knowledge and embodied knowledge, one will have temporary fame, for knowing words, but after people who have given one recognition will also expect certain, certain behavioral protocols and way of conduct to follow these words. They look at the alim and say, well, what's your, where's his amal? Because the desire for fame precludes the moral formation that could produce embodied results, people will start to see that this person only talks the talk, but cannot walk the walk. They will then rescind their recognition, and the person desirous of fame will end up imagining himself to be famous, while in reality he is despised. Conclusion People who study his malfudat and bawa'id witness how his words enact practical actions in their daily life. Thus, in this special way, Mawlana Tanwi exemplifies not only the transmission of ilm, but also the transmission of amal. In fact, for him, for him ilm and amal constitute a single ontological reality that the pious predecessors, the Salaf Salihin of the Muslims had perceived and practiced so effortlessly. In many ways, the legacy of Imam Ghazali rahimahullah, and Mawlana Tanwi rahmatullahi alayhi, are not dissimilar. That's why I said he's the Ghazali of his time. The, the reason I provide here. The internal struggle that gave the world the Ghazali of the Ihya, the Kimiya, the Mishkat and the Bidaya is also found in the early life of Mawlana Tanwi. However, to a much lesser extent, as evident with some of his early correspondences with Hazrat Mawlana uh, Rashid Ahmad Gangohi rahmatullahi alayhi, and then subsequent retraction of those views as an example. However, once conviction had been achieved, just like with Ghazali, it shone through every aspect of their lives. The exemplary alim Sufi amalgam that personified both figures perhaps holds the key to the similarity of their legacies. Like Imam Ghazali, in the latter part of his life, Maulana Tanwi also settled at the Khanqa in Tanabawan, as opposed to a large madrasa. Imam Ghazali settled back in his hometown of Tus and did not go back to the Nizamiya college, and transformed it into a center of excellence. Maulana Tanwi transformed it into a center of excellence and in the exoteric and the esoteric, the batin and the zahir disciplines. The sawuf has been broadly characterized as having four normative dimensions. The intellectual discipline, the tasawuf nazari, spiritual practice, the tasawuf amali, literary tradition, the writings, and social institution, the way it's practiced. Mawlana Tanwi integrally participated in all four of these dimensions, unlike some of the other Sufis. They weren't able to practice all, they weren't able to involve themselves in all of them. Perhaps even more so Imam Ta Mawlana Tanwi than even Imam Ghazali in some of these, in some of the four. While Imam Ghazali is considered the mujaddid of the 5th century Hijri, Mawlana Tanwi has been considered the mujaddid of his century. Imam Ghazali brought tasawwuf to the masses and can be credited for popularizing it. The most salient aspect of Mawlana Tanwi's tajdeed, reform and revival of tasawwuf lies in his total conviction to recapture and redefine its essential spirit that had become so severely solid and confused by, by centuries of confusion. He made it, he made the sawf more accessible to one and all by elucidating it as a strict perseverance on the Sharia. That is Tanwi and Tasawwuf. The initiation charter that was given to all the new initiates in his Khanqa is quite telling in this regard. This particular initi uh, initial charter is called the Haqiqatu Tariqa, which is part of this translation of Sufi study of hadith that Turath has, mashallah, so ably had translated. Sheikh Yusuf Talal, Talal de Lorenzo has translated it. And uh, that is what, uh, that was one of the impetus for this, pro uh, for this program. I'd like to end with saying that it's really unfortunate that despite the people of the subcontinent knowing Mona Tanwi so well, the Arabs don't know about him as much. Despite the fact that they know about many others. And the English-speaking world doesn't have any good, able uh, professional translations. It's something that I would encourage everybody to think about and uh, contribute to in any way that you can.
بارك الله فيكم جزاكم الله خيرا السلام عليكم ورحمه الله